All right. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> All right. I guess it's time to start. Uh, my name is Sage Weil. I'm Ceph Principal Architect at Red Hat, and today I'm going to talk about Ceph, Manila, and a little bit about containers in OpenStack. Um, so just a brief outline um, of my talk. I'm going to give a bit of background on Ceph and CephFS. I'm going to give an update on the current state of CephFS. I'm um, going to talk about what the current landscape in Manila looks like, um, the CephFS native driver we're working on, um, and then sort of segue into um, our, our plan for better file system plumbing into virtual machines in OpenStack, um, well, how that affects Manila versus Nova and how the responsibilities might break down um, and what that means for containers. Um, so let's start with Ceph and CephFS, or actually, why should we use files in the cloud um, instead of, say, object storage? Um, the, the biggest reason is that file-based applications aren't going away. POSIX is lingua franca in the computing world. Um, it's important to be able to interoperate with other storage systems and data sets. Um, as um, more people start using containers, um, container volumes are really just directories in a file system. Um, we probably want to be able to support that effectively. Um, and it turns out that permissions and directories are actually useful concepts. So we shouldn't just throw them out um, because there's something else. Um, one might ask why not just take a block device and put a local file system on top. Um, the problem there is that um, block devices really aren't shared. When you put a local file system on it, it ex expects exclusive access to that block device. So it's not useful for sharing data between, volume, between virtual machines. Um, and also block devices aren't very elastic. It's difficult to expand and contract the file systems there. Um, whereas shared distributed file systems usually do this quite, quite naturally. Um, why should we look at Ceph? Um, Ceph is designed from the ground up to scale horizontally, which makes it a very good fit for the cloud. It has no single point of failure. Um, it's hardware agnostic. It's designed to run on commodity hardware. Um, and because it's designed to run at scale, it's self-managing whenever possible. Um, and importantly, it's also open source, completely free and open source, which makes it a good fit for, for OpenStack. Um, also, as we're building Ceph, um, our goal has always been to move beyond legacy approaches. That means that we try to adopt a client cluster paradigm. Um, where the people who are the clients that are talking to Ceph understand that there are actually a whole mess of servers that are storing their data that might be failing and migrating things around and they're fully capable and prepared to deal with that situation and start talking to the right server in order to find the data that they need. Um, so this no Ceph talk would be complete with us without this diagram, um, high level Ceph architecture. It's all based on Rados, this uh, red bit at the bottom. It's a distributed object store that manages the di distribution replication of all data in the system. Um, if nodes fail, then it migrates data away from them, re-replicates it, makes sure that your data is separated across failure domains, handles cluster expansion, contraction, all that good stuff. Um, and then on top of Rados, we build a number of different high-level services. There's the Rados Gateway, which gives you S3 and Swift compatible API object storage. There's RBD, which gives you block storage, um, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with. And there's also CephFS, which gives you a fully distributed POSIX file system that sits on top of Rados. And it's this last bit that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so CephFS um, stores all of its files as objects in Rados that the clients access directly, which means that you have very scalable and high performance access to your data. Um, it scales as, just as Rados does. It also has scalable metadata access because the metadata in the system, the files and directories and permissions and so forth, are distributed across a whole set of metadata servers that are dynamically managing that, that file system namespace. And it provides you a POSIX interface, so it's a drop-in replacement for, for any local or network file system. There are multiple clients that are implemented for CephFS. There's one in the Linux kernel that's been there for, for many years now. There's a user space implementation that you can access via Fuse, that's so called CephFuse. And you can also access it via libcephfs.so, which is a shared library that can be linked into Samba to re-export via Sys, um, Ganesha to re-export via NFS, and it can also be linked into Hadoop to run big data type analytics workloads. Um, the thing that truly makes CephFS unique is its use of dynamic subtree partitioning. And the idea here is that you have a whole hierarchy of files in your file system, and CephFS will sort of on the fly take pieces of that hierarchy and carve it up and distribute it among the different metadata servers in the system. You can do this pretty arbitrarily. I can even take a single directory that has lots of files or, or is very busy and shard that into lots of little pieces and then distribute those fragments across different metadata servers. This makes uh, the Ceph metadata server cluster highly scalable because we can arbitrarily partition the hierarchy into little pieces. Um, supporting tens or hundreds of metadata servers. It's also adaptive because this partition is based on the current workload. So as different jobs start up and users start using the file system, then the metadata servers will migrate load from the busy servers to the idle servers and make sure adjust that partition over time to fully distribute and take advantage of all the servers in the cluster. 
It can even take hot metadata and replicate it across multiple nodes um, so that you get the best performance that you can. There are a lot of other good cool things in CephFS. Um, it has a strongly consistent and coherent client caches, something that NFS um, has never had, um, which means that it's going to behave the same way as a local file system will. Um, it has a recursive accounting feature that's relatively, I think, completely unique actually, in that um, it keeps track hierarchically of everything that's stored in the system. So if you look at the size of a directory, instead of getting sort of a bogus 4K number, um, it'll tell you the number of bytes that are stored in that entire subtree of the hierarchy. The same thing that you would get out of a DU um, for free, which is pretty nice. You can take snapshots on any directory in the file system. Um, you have directory quotas where you can limit the size of a subtree um, based on the number of bytes stored or files stored. It supports X adders, ACLs. Um, on the kernel client, there's also support for client-side persistent caching using the kernel's FS cache um, subsystem. Uh, so lots of good stuff. And we've been putting a lot of work into it. Um, CephFS is actually where Ceph began some 10 years ago. And um, sadly, it's also sort of the last thing to become production ready. Um, but we, we're, we're changing that um, as we focus over the last year primarily on resilience. So our focus has been on handling errors gracefully, detecting and reporting issues that we see in the system, um, and providing recovery tools in case things go horribly wrong. And our goal is to really achieve this first in the single metadata server situation so that we have the, the highest confidence that things are going to work and you're not going to lose any data. Um, part of this has been dogfooding this um, the system in our own environment. So the Ceph QA infrastructure is relatively large and storing lots of data and so forth. We've been running all that on CephFS for, for more than a year now. Um, and we found and fixed several sort of hard to reproduce bugs, mostly in the kernel client, but also a few in the MDS. Um, that you, things that you would only really see running in a production environment. Um, but we're happy to say that it's been quite stable for some time now. Um, at least on the CephFS side, we've had um, other issues because it's running on really, really old, terrible hardware. Um, but those things aside, um, we're quite happy with it. Um, which is, uh, makes me happy to say that we plan to um, call CephFS production ready in the next stable release, Jewel, um, coming out in the quarter one of this coming year. So that's very exciting and it's been a long time coming. Yay. Yay. Um, so as I said, there's a lot of work that's been going in into CephFS. Um, that includes improved health checks for diagnosing problems. You can identify which clients are misbehaving, um, which OSDs are misbehaving. There are lots of diagnostic tools, so you can debug the system, figure out um, what requests are passing through the MDS if they're hung or something like that. Uh, there's better full space management. There's client management for evicting those misbehaving clients. Um, and also work on continuous verification so that you can scrub an online system and make sure that there are no errors without taking it offline and doing some sort of um, consistency check. Um, but our real focus, again, has been on, on this FS check and repair because although we don't, we've, we haven't, there are no real known issues with FFS that we've been trying to fix, it's not that stability has been bad. It's really that um, we want to make sure that we have the tools available to recover data if we do have people in the wild running it sort of in earnest um, that run into problems. We want to have some confidence that we'll be able to fix their problem without having to write custom tools to, to go do that. Um, so we want repair tools that handle the loss of data objects in case Rados totally fails and loses some stuff, some of your data. Um, and also, more importantly, tools that will recover the loss of metadata objects in case the metadata for the file system gets corrupted, we'll be able to rebuild that. Um, so there's a CephFS journal tool that we put together that's sort of a disaster recovery for the MDS journal structure um, that can pull recently written metadata out and put it back into the, the metadata pool. Um, there's a table tool that adjusts some of the other internal metadata structures. Um, and the last bit that's probably the most important is the CephFS data scan tool which um, is, can be used if there's a complete loss of all the metadata in the system. You can actually rebuild a file system hierarchy from all the metadata that's attached to the file objects in, the, in a separate Rados pool. Um, so in case things go horribly wrong, we'll be able to get your data back. Um, and all that is going to be ready for Jewel, so that's very exciting. Uh, one of the other new things is around access control. Um, so we had a couple of interns over the summer. Um, the first was a Google Summer of Code student who was working on path-based authentication. The idea here is just to take a client and restrict them to a subdirectory mount within the system. Um, that's now implemented in the MDS. Um, there's one missing piece that will also allow them to be locked inside a Rados namespace. That will be in the Jewel release. Um, so thanks to Josh on from Google Summer of Code for that. Um, we're also working on a user-based authentication system, which is slightly different. The idea here is that you have a client that's mounting as a specific UID and GID, and then we enforce some Unix permissions on the server. Um, that eventually we like to also wire into sort of external auth auth frameworks like Kerberos or Active Directory um, to be used in sort of multi-user, um, I guess, IT environments. Um, and that was an outreachy intern student. Um, so that's all new. 
Um, so that's, that's what's new in CephFS, um, lots of excitement there. Um, which brings me to OpenStack. Um, so I'm going to start a bit by talking about um, the current landscape in Manila, and then we'll see how Ceph sort of fits into that. Um, so Manila, as you all know, manages file volumes or file shares. You can create and delete shares. Um, uh, it manages some of the file server network connectivity to the tenants, um, and it has some stuff around snapshot management for those volumes. Uh, but there are also some awkward bits with the current sort of user experience for, for Manila. Um, Ma Manila only manages, manages part of the connectivity problem, so it creates these neutron share networks that, let the, that expose the, the file shares to a neutron network, but it's sort of the user's responsibility to then attach the tenant to that network and actually go and do the mount on the system. Um, so this sort of last mile um, is up to the user, and so Manila is only sort of half managing half of, half of that problem. It's also sort of assuming that the way that the files are being attached to the tenant is network-based, so it assumes you're using something like NFS, or SIFS or CFFS, that is a network-based protocol, which isn't always necessarily what you want when you start thinking about containers. Um, so more about that a little bit later. Um, so most of the Manila drivers are appliance drivers, um, sort of in the OpenStack tradition. Um, the idea here is basically that you want to be able to tell an appliance to create an NFS share and export it to a particular IP, and then create the Neutron network to actually do that, that network plumbing. Um, there are lots of these drivers from the usual suspects. Um, and the only thing, real thing worth pointing out is that the security in this model, because the tenant has access to the file server over that neutral network, then the security is sort of punted to the appliance. It's assumed that the appliance is effective and secure at actually enforcing the security restrictions that you have that, that it can do that, um, which, is, which is generally true. Um, there's also a generic share driver um, that, is, that is not proprietary, it's fully open source. Um, the idea here is to take existing OpenStack components and build a file service out of that. So you start with a cinder volume and you attach it to a service VM that you create, put a local file system on top like XFS, run a Ganesha NFS server there, and then share that over Neutron to, to, the, um, to your tenant. Um, the nice thing is that we're building out of existing components and it's all fully open and, and usable. Um, and it gives you the, that tenant isolation, so the, the tenant can't talk to the storage network where whatever, wherever your actual storage is coming from. So it gives you that security. On the flip side, it's not the most efficient thing. You have this extra network hop, you have to go through the service VM in order to reach your storage, so it's not going to perform as well as it could. Um, you have this extra VM that you have to run that consumes additional resources, and that VM is also a single point of failure. If that, if that node goes down, then you lose your file service, even if your back-end storage system is highly available and expensive and so forth. But this is a reference driver, it's in Manila, you can use it today. Um, so that's all good. There's a, a very similar set of drivers that are built around Ganesha as well and service VMs. Um, so currently this is used for, for ClusterFS, um, but you can do the same thing with CephFS. So the idea here is that you take um, this Ganesha driver toolkit that they built, you start up a service VM that's again running Ganesha, but instead of using um, a cinder volume, you use the Ganesha SSL sort of backend abstraction and have that talk directly to the backend distributed file system. Um, and then you ex export NFS to, to, the, to the tenant. Um, but again, this has, um, it's nice that it has sort of a simple existing model that we've already used with the reference driver. Um, and it has this good security where you're isolating the tenant from the network where your distributed file system backend is actually running. Um, but again, the problem is that you have this extra hop. Um, the service VM is a single point of failure um, and consumes additional resources. Um, so this Manila Ganesha toolkit is written sort of modularly. It's used by the current ClusterFS um, share driver. Um, in Vanilla, it's not yet something that we've implemented in CephFS um, for reasons that I will talk about right now. So in our view, the, the problem with service, the service VM approach is that the architecture is somewhat limited. It's always going to be slower because you have this extra hop through the service VM, and it's always going to be expensive because you're running this extra VM doing, doing all this extra work. Um, the other problem is that the current implementation isn't highly available. So you need some service monitoring to make sure that VM doesn't go down, and if it does, you have to restart it. Um, it's a single VM. There's no sort of HA load distribution or anything like that. Um, and sort of an implementation detail. The way the current Manila code is written, it's sort of assuming that there's a single service endpoint that's doing this, doing this process. Um, so a lot of that's fixable. Um, there's sort of a big to-do list to make this sort of something that's fully robust and usable. Um, but before we invest all that effort to do that, I think the question that we need to ask is, is this really the right endpoint? Um, is this what we, how we really want to plumb access to tenants to Ceph, I guess, in our case? Um, is, that, is that really what we want to do? Um, and this caused us, well, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so the starting point here is um, we first built a sort of a simpler approach, avoid the service VM, and let's just give 
the tenancy ability to mount CephFS directly. So we made a CephFS native driver as a reference. So the, the idea here is that you have um, the tenant, you just give it access to the storage network, sort of ignore the security implications for now, and you mount CephFS directly from the tenant VM. So the nice thing here is that you get really good performance, you have a direct network access, the client talks directly to Ceph, um, you have access to the full CephFS feature set, you use the native kernel driver, um, and it's nice and simple. Um, but there are a few drawbacks. Um, the guest has to run a modern Linux um, distribution that actually has an up-to-date Ceph client. Um, it exposes the tenant to the Ceph cluster network, which might be a security cern concern in your environment. Um, the networking is currently up to the user, so it's up to the user to make sure that that tenant has access to the storage network. Um, and sort of a detail, the, the tenant client needs to be delivered a secret that it uses to mount the file system. Although I guess in the Manila session today, they sort of they sorted that out, so that's, that's coming soon. Um, one of the things that made this driver um, simpler to implement is to implement first a library that we use to manage the CephFS volumes or shares um, that we're providing to Manila. So this is a um, CephFS volume manager at Pi that wraps, sits on top of the libcephfs Python bindings, which then talk directly to Ceph. That's going to be packaged as part of the Ceph Python RPM and Deb. Um, and the basic idea here is that Manila shares or volumes are just directories in CephFS. Um, so you might have slash Manila, the consistency group, and then the, the volume ID. Um, and this library just captures all the basic volume management tasks that you would expect. So you can create volumes, you can delete them, um, create snapshots on a volume or on, a, or on an entire consistency group, um, which is really trivial in CephFS. You just have to do a make dir inside the sort of magical snapshot directory. Um, and it also, one of the Otter um, API calls in Manila is the ability to take a snapshot and promote it to a volume that you can then mount. I think that's the only way you can actually access um, a Manila share. And so if you want to read write, then you actually have to make a copy because CephFS doesn't support um, writable snapshots. You probably never will. Or if you want to read only one, you can just create a symlink. Um, but the nice thing is that because the volume manager sort of wraps up all this complexity and is packaged as part of Ceph, then the Manila driver is really simple. It's only 250 lines of code, um, which, is, which is nice. Excuse me. Um, so the challenge here is that um, is really the security. Um, so the core issue is that the tenant now has access to the storage network so it can talk directly to CephFS, which means that Ceph is the one that's responsible for enforcing whatever security restrictions that you have. Um, so Ceph actually has had proper authentication for years, um, since like 2009. Um, and our authentication model is modeled after Kerberos, um, which provides mutual authentication of client and server. The client knows it's talking to the right server and the server knows that the client has the secret and is the right one. Um, so what's really new here is that we've added this additional authorization that um, allows you to say that this particular client, if they authenticate, is only allowed to access a particular directory in CephFS. Um, that's the Google Summer Code project I mentioned is now upstream. Um, and there's this one missing piece around Rados namespaces that again will be present in Joule um, the release next year. Um, so the real question then is, is that enough? Is that a sufficient security model to give you confidence that you can give tenants access to your storage network? Um, it means that Ceph security is the only barrier. Um, Ceph hasn't been hardened against denial of service the same way that um, many other systems have. Um, that may or may not be a problem in your environment. Um, I think it really depends is whether this is sort of a public cloud where your users are totally untrusted or whether it's a more trusted environment like a private cloud. Um, and it's something that you as an administrator has to answer um, in your context. Um, but the security is sort of, it's, it's, it's a bit of a problem. So what we're really looking for is a better way to plumb file access to virtual machines so that we can have something that we can use in a totally untrusted environment like a public cloud. Um, which brings me to this discussion. Um, and so we want a couple of things. We want better security. We want the same sort of protection and isolation that we have with block storage. We want simplici simplicity of configuration and deployment, um, just as we do with Kinu and librbd. Um, the host just attaches a block and it's, it's there for the guests and you don't really have to do anything special. Um, and we'd also like good performance. Um, ideally performance that's, that's similar to what we would get with a native access to CephFS. Um, so there are a couple of different models that we've looked at to try to achieve this. Um, the first thing that we looked at that initially we were very excited about was the use of 9P in, in KVM. So 9P is a file sharing protocol analogous to NFS. Um, and VertFS is an embedded 9P server that's part of Kimu. So the idea is that Kimu itself has a file server that exports just to the guest and then the guest kernel mounts over 9P using a VertIO transport to make it nice and fast and efficient. Um, so the idea here is to link libcephfs into Kimu into the same way that librbd is, and it sort of links directly into this vertfs embedded on 9p server. 
Um, and then the guest OS, which has to be Linux in this case, uses the special version of the NIMP protocol that IBM updated like five or seven years ago um, to mount VertFS, which then is actually re-exporting with ZFS over the network. So a very similar model to the way that LibRBD is used today. It's sort of easy to deploy. Um, the nice thing is that this gives you good, good, good security. The tenant is isolated again from, from the network, um, from the storage network and locked inside a particular directory. And it's really easy to deploy. It, it's sort of um, frictionless in the same way that LibRBD is. Um, but on the other hand, it requires modern Linux, gu Linux guests that have support for 9P. And perhaps more, more importantly, 9P isn't supported in uh, most um, Linux distributions today, at least not the Red Hat ones. Um, and it, I found out after talking to all the developers that there are actually two different reasons for this. One is that the 9P kernel client, um, the kernel developers don't really like and don't really want to support. And on the Kimu side, the VertFS server, um, the Kimu developers also don't really like it. They're, they have concerns about the code quality. Um, so on both fronts, it's not, it's not the most attractive option. Now to be fair, code quality is something that can be fixed. It's open source code, that's the whole point. Um, so that could improve over time. Um, but the other issue is that 9P just isn't the best file sharing protocol at least in my opinion, and it's, it's second to NFS or something like native CFS. Um, but it's an option. Um, there's in fact a prototype um, put together by some developers at United Stack. Um, that includes both the Kimu patches to plumb libcephfs in there and the Manila driver that orchestrates CFS and some changes in Nova to actually do the attachment through libvert and, and so on. Um, but we'd really like something better. So why, not we, why don't we look at a, a different file system protocol that we all know and love. We can just use, use NFS. So the idea here is that you would um, mount CFS on the host or maybe use Ganesha um, and then re-export NFS to the guest OS over a private network that just the host and the guest share. Um, so again, you have the same isolation of the, of the tenant from the storage network, which is nice. Um, NFS is supported by everyone, which is good. Um, it's reliable in the sense that the NFS server gateway is in the same fault domain as the, as the guest. So if that host goes down, um, everything fails together, so it doesn't really matter. Um, and it works for any file system, not just FFS. Um, on the flip side, NFS has kind of weak cache consistency. Um, it's a better file sharing protocol, it's not, it's not the best one. Um, and the protocol translation will slow us down a little bit. Um, but the main issue here, I mean those are probably not that big of an issue, but the main issue is that it's sort of awkward and insecure networking to, to have this sort of s simple private network that's attaching the, the host and the guest um, for a couple of different reasons. Um, it means that you have to add a dedicated network to the virtual machine, you have to configure a local subnet on the host and assign IPs to the host and the guest, you have to configure NFS in the hypervisor and you have to then mount that to the virtual machine. Um, the Kimu guys tell me that it's um, awkward to have these special purpose network interfaces that you attach to the KVM instance that are sort of external to what the user is asking for. I, I don't know enough to actually know why that is. Um, it also means that the, you're sort of dependent on the networking configuration inside the guest. So things like firewall D running inside the virtual machine might break this. Um, if the user just restarts networking, their file servers, first service might go away, which could be problematic. Um, and they also will just see that there's this weird network interface and network configured um, that they might not realize is actually important for getting their file access to the root file system, which can be problematic. But I think the, one of the things that concerns me the most is really the security implication where other services on the host might inadvertently be exposed to the guest. So for example, you might have a daemon like SSH that's binding to all IPs on the host system that the guest can then access over this prior ne private network. So hopefully the the sysadmin has, has firewall set up to prevent that, but you know who knows what's really going to happen. So we'd like a better alternative, um, and the one we've found is um, called VSOC. So VSOC is actually based on VMware vSockets. It's a newish address type family um, that's designed specifically for communication between virtual machines and hosts. Excuse me. Um, so it's stream-based or connectionless, just like IP. Um, and this address is like dead simple. It's just an integer to identify which virtual machine you're talking to, and one is the host. Um, and it's been supported in Linux since version 3.9, so we're over two years now. Um, and, the, and the key attraction here is that it's zero configuration. So the hypervisor always has address one, and the VMs are just assigned addresses above that. But nothing has to be configured inside the virtual machine. Um, once you start up Kimu and tell it which VSOC address it is, it's just, it has it. Um, so it's all there. Um, so the approach, the idea then is to do this NFS export from the guest to the, from the host to the guest over VSOC instead. Um, so there are some 
some uh, details here. We have to use NFS v4.1 v4 only. Um, that's because older VF NFS versions have all this annoying um, protocol stuff that requires addressing. So older versions of NFS use Lochte, for example, and that address gets shared, and it's a whole mess, so you can't really tunnel it over VSOC. Um, whereas v4.1 consolidates everything over a single connection, so that's good. It's also much easier to support because, um, or it's easy to add support for VSOC to existing services. It's really mostly boilerplate code to support a new address type, um, and then adding parsing for the, for the way that you actually parse the address. Um, so there are patches in flight for the NFS client and NFS server from Stefan, who's a, a Kimi developer. There are patches for Ganesha to add VSOC support from Matt Benjamin, and there's also patches to NFS utils so that the mount command line utility will work and make this all work. So this is all sort of shiny brand new, um, but we have prototypes working and running, um, and it seems very attractive. So the, the overall picture then is that you would mount CephFS on the host and re-export it via KNFSD to a particular VSOC address for the virtual machine. Or you can use Ganesha to do the same thing if you don't want to use the kernel client. Um, and then you would export it just to that virtual machine's VSOC address. Um, so the nice thing is that NFS is well supported, even NFS 4.1. Um, the security is better, it's simpler configuration, it's more reliable. Um, the only real drawback to this approach, from our perspective, is just that VSOC, VSOC support is brand new in Kimu and NFS, so it's going to take a while for all those patches to land and make it into distributions. Um, so we really like this model for a couple of sort of key reasons. One is security. Uh, the tenant remains isolated from the storage network. Um, and there's no shared IP network between the host and the guest, so you don't have to worry about this accidentally exposing host services to the guest network. Um, there's, it's very simple. So there's no network configuration beside, aside from the host just um, assigning VSOC addresses to each virtual machine. Um, it, it goes back to a model where you treat the virtual machine as a black box. So there's no configuration that has to happen. It'll either use that VSOC address or it won't. Um, and there's no software-defined networking. You don't have to worry about Neutron or anything like that involved. Um, we like the reliability model because the, the gateway that's sitting on the host is in the same hardware fault domain. Um, so if, if um, that node fails, the guest fails too, and you don't have to really worry about dealing with them failing independently from each other. Um, there are fewer network traversals, so the I.O. stays on the host and then goes to the distributed file system. You don't have to hop to a service VM that might be running on another machine in your cloud. Um, which means that the performance is going to be much better. So it's a clear win over having a service VM where you have multiple network hops. It might also end up being a performance win over using TCP, although currently we're not optimized for that. Um, the VSOC driver in Kimi uses Vert.io, um, but it's not really optimized for performance. It's really about configuration and simplicity and security. Um, but there are some challenges. Um, so it's VSOC is a new hotness. It's brand new. We have to get all this code upstream. So it's sort of work in progress. Um, there is some host configuration that has to happen. So the host has to decide what address the addresses are for the VMs. Um, and someone actually needs to go and do all this configuration. So they need to mount Ceph on the host and set up the NFS export to the guest um, to actually make this happen. Um, and so the big question for us is, what is the user experiment experience going to look like? So does the consumer of the Manila API, are they expected to just know that this is how everything is going to work and that they're going to have to mount this magical VSOC address? Um, in order to, to attach to their share? Um, what, or is there gonna be, are there going to be new APIs that do some of this work for them and then tell them what the mount mechanism is going to be? Um, so that's, that's a big question. Which brings me to one of my final topics, which is really how the responsibility for this is going to break down between what Manila is doing on the sort of the file share side and what Nova is doing with all these virtual machines. So um, Manila obviously is managing the shares and volumes and Nova is managing the virtual machines. Um, I think that the cleanest analogy to look at is the Cinder Nova break breakdown. So in Cinder, it also just manages the volumes. Nova manages the VMs. But Nova has this additional set of API calls that let you attach um, a, Nova, a Cinder volume to a virtual machine because that's driver dependent. It knows how to do it with KVM, um, but maybe for other hypervisors it doesn't. Um, so we think that the same model work, should work well for, for Manila. Um, so what we'd like to see, ideally, um, is a new API in Nova that allows you to attach a file system, um, a Manila file system, um, to a particular guest. So um, in this case, the hypervisor is the one that's sort of mediating access to that, that file access share. Um, it might do some network configuration, like attaching to the Neutron share network that Manila has created. Um, it might be assigning the VSOC address and setting up this NFS re-export. Um, it would be totally driver dependent in that case. Um, it also is going to be important to figure out how, how this is going to work in a container environment where it's not KVM at all, but it's no LXC or something like that. 
Um, we also think we need to have a second API, a API call that lets you fetch the access metadata, which tells the user how they're going to mount the system. Um, so which VSOC address they need to mount, or whether they should mount over the network, um, or whether it's a bind mount from something inside a container. Um, and because no Nova now understands which file systems are going to be attached to the tenant, um, it can manage things like reattaching these file shares after you reboot the system, or if the Nova VM gets migrated to another host, it can also do whatever configuration is necessary on the new host in order to make that, make that work. Um, so we made a chart of what all the different Nova drivers would actually have to do in this case. I'll just look at a couple of these. So in sort of the traditional Manila model where we're exporting NFS over the network, the attach might just take the virtual machine that you already have and, uh, and connect it to the Neutron network that the Manila is managing. Um, in the case of doing this VSOC thing with Ganesha, um, the attach API would actually set up the Ganesha server on the host, um, assign a VSOC address to the VM, and do that NFS export configuration. Um, and in the case of sort of a completely different environment where you're using one of the container Nova drivers like LXC or LXD, um, it might be do something completely different. Like it might mount the Ceph file system on the host and then just do a bind mount in the container namespace so that you can access that file share. And it's because the way that the guest accesses the file system is completely dependent on what the Nova driver is that Nova really needs to be involved in this whole process and do that arbitration. Um, which brings me to containers, which is sort of the last little bit here. Um, so our vision here is that um, when you're using LXC or LXD in a Nova environment, um, that you want something, sort of the ideal model here to plumb that file access to the guest is something that's, that's very different than what you use from, from KVM. You don't necessarily want a container to have a new NFS mount um, to the file server. There's a much more effective way to do that. So the idea is that you would mount Ceph um, or whatever other file system on the host and then just do a mount dash bind somewhere into the container namespace. Um, so our thought is that you would actually mount this to something in slash dev, um, and then the user would do the final mount to whatever their final location is within their, within their file system so that they can attach that file share where they want to see it. Um, the pros here is that you get the best performance using sort of the native driver on the host. Containers are all about sort of cutting out the virtualization overhead, so that's all good. And you also get the full stuff of S semantics um, with like snapshots and so forth um, through the command line. Um, the only real drawbacks here are that you're relying on the container for security, which is sort of obvious since you're, since you're using containers in the first place. Um, but in order to make this model work, you really need that Nova attached detach API because doing this plumbing is entirely dependent on that, on the Nova driver that you're using. Um, so, in summary, um, the Ceph native driver for Manila is something that we've created. It should land soon, we hope. Um, uh, it works for us, and, uh, and the, the next version of Ceph Jewel, which comes out quarter one of next year, is going to have a stable production-ready CephFS. Um, so we hope to have sort of a complete solution where we can use, can use Ceph and Manila in real cloud soon. Um, the current Manila drivers are sort of um, centered around appliances. Um, and are also assuming sort of a, a virtual machine network file system um, access model um, and don't really contemplate containers. Um, we think that NFS over VSOC is going to be a better way to plumb file access to, to containers. Um, we think it's very promising um, for simplicity reasons, reliability, security, and performance. Um, and there's, there's a lot of choice there. You can use the NFS kernel server, Ganesha, whatever, whatever stack um, we find to be most reliable or attractive. Um, but in order to make this happen, we really need to sort out this interaction between Nova and Manila and where the responsibility breaks down in, in terms of connecting this file shares um, to the guests. Because um, we think that those Nova APIs are going to help us handle the non-KVM users, particularly containers. Um, they might even help in the ironic, ironic case. Um, but most importantly, it'll, it'll allow sort of the right person, in, in this case Nova, be responsible for setting up that, that gateway that re-exports the NFS to the guest. So that's it. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Yes? Sorry, I'll just repeat the question. Um, when, you, when you connect or you export something over VSOC, does the guest get notification? And the answer there, I'm pretty sure, is no. Um, in fact, it's, it's, it's analogous to a server exposing a service on its, on the other end of the network, you don't know until you try to connect to it. Um, yes, so there's still this, the, the last step of the, the user tenant actually mounting the file system is still sort of left up to the user.
Um, and I think, in general, there's um, a lot of reluctance to have any of the OpenStack services reaching inside the container and doing any work. Um, there's some agents that do some things, that, but that always, I think, has to be an opt-in behavior. Um, so I think, the, I think the approach that makes the most sense is to make sure that there is a user-facing API that gives the user all the information it needs to know how to do the mount. And then they can do that, that final step. Uh, with, with all the dual goodness and CFFS, are there any um, caveats to running you, the rest of your cluster on Hammer or something? So can you have dual CFFS with everything else on Hammer? Um, you definitely need the dual Ceph metadata server. Um, I'm trying to remember if there are any dependencies on the OSDs. Um, I think currently there aren't, but by the time we get to Joule, there will be. Um, we changed the way that object enumeration works um, so that the recovery tools work properly. Um, and in general, it's going to be something that you would, you're better off doing anyway, keeping, keeping everything on the same version. Uh, but Joule is going to be the next LTS release. So it's probably going to be the version that will be in 1604 Ubuntu. It will be in the next Red Hat storage release that comes out next spring. Um, so by that time, you're probably going to want to upgrade to Joule anyway. Uh, back here. Sorry? Sorry. Open stack Magnum is the question. Um, so uh, I don't know a whole lot about Magnum, but my understanding is that um, my understanding is that Magnum is about um, wrapping um, Kubernetes, and then Kubernetes would be orchestrating containers. Um, I'm not. My understanding is that those containers are actually running inside Nova VMs or on top of Ironic. It's not actually orchestrating containers that Nova itself is managing? No, that's not entirely not correct. Not so sure. with yeah. Magnum, uh, the containers are not managed by Nova. So you did talk about yeah. integrating with Nova. So the question mm -hmm. is whether whether you guys have any plans with in about integrating with OpenStack Magnum, which does not involve Nova. Um, on the storage side, we have we have no plans. So I don't I don't know what the, the larger strategy around container orchestration is. That's not really my area. Um, I think if if it is if you are do end up using Nova to manage those containers, then all the stuff is just going to work. Um, if you don't, if those containers exist inside of existing Nova instances, um, then again, we would use whatever methodology makes the most sense to get the file access into the Nova tenant, and then you would have to do some additional work to get it inside the the Magnum container. Yes. Do you have any plan to support? Uh, Export uh, export uh, HDFS in, uh, through Manila and uh, integrate with the Sahara project. Um, we don't have specific plans around that on the Ceph side. Uh, my understanding is that there's already an HD, HDFS Manila driver. In fact, there was a talk I think yesterday about doing just that. Um, so I think you can already do that. Um, if you want to do all that on top of Ceph and run HDFS on top of Ceph, I don't know. I don't think you want to do that. So, no, <laughs> I guess is the answer, no. Yes? Uh, the question is about a CephFS Windows client. Um, one doesn't exist. It uses a framework called Dokan, which is sort of like a user space file system framework for Windows. Um, it's out of tree right now. It's a separate project, although it's on the, the GitHub Ceph group repository. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to, to sort of bring that fork in line with the mainline code. Um, so. I think it works, but I've never tried it, so your mileage may vary. Uh, yes, back here. Hi there. Is, um, is this going to cause any problems? Is Manila going to cause any problems for the RDMA project with Ceph? Um, I don't think it should make any difference. Um, well, no. If, if, you're, if you're using the Ceph native driver where the, the tenant VM wants to mount CephFS directly, um, RDMA is not going to work in that context, I assume. Um, if you are going to do something like the VSOC model that I'm talking about that we're looking at, then it's just a matter of whether the host um, kernel supports RDMA, because it's the one that's actually mounting CephFS. So in that case, it would work. Um, and I, I think that would be true whether you're using the NFS or the kernel client in NF kernel NFS or whether you're using Ganesha using libcephFS. In both cases, it's really a matter of what the host operating system and kernel support. And that VSOC part is sort of separate. Considering that for the Hammer drive, uh, RDB only supports Rome, and now CloudFS is becoming uh, stable, would it make sense 
Um, yes, and in fact, that's one of the reasons why we think Nova should be the one that's managing these attachments, because you want to be able to attach a file system and then live migrate it to another host and have it still, still keep working. And if um, plumbing the file access to the VM involves this sort of complicated going through a gateway that's on the host, and Manila's trying to like push configuration to the Nova hypervisor to do that, and it's going to break. Drive. For the ephemeral drive. Like the, like the boot volume? Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> you can use FFS on the hosts. Okay. Uh -huh. And then you use QCAL2. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you could do that. That's not, it's probably not what I would recommend. Um, although I know some people do do that. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Yes. Um, which replication? Geo replication. Geo oh, geo-replication. Um, not initially, no. Um, that's that's going to be a ways off before that's supported. I think eventually we'll want to look at that, but um, we're focusing initially on doing geo-replication in the Rados gateway for federating all these object gateways um, and on the block device for replicating block devices, which will be in, in the Jewel release. Um, but on, for CephFS, we aren't looking at geo-replication yet. Uh, yes. Is there a vanilla client, or or everything's done through the Nova system? I assume there's a vanilla client, but honestly, I don't know. I'm not I'm not the OpenStack expert around here. It turns out. Yes. Uh, what's the of uh, FSR for Windows guys? Um, you're talking about file access for Windows clients. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned before, there is a CephFS client for Windows based on the Dokken framework, um, but it's out of tree and um, we haven't tested it directly, so I'm not sure how well it works, but I believe it does work to some degree. Um, what if the uh, Windows VM wants to be used as a NFS? Over VSOC. Um, that I'm not sure about, um, but I'm guessing it's possible because um, this VSOC socket type is actually many years old. I think VMware added it to VMware, what, ESX like five years ago or more, and they got it upstream in Linux maybe two years ago. Um, and my guess is that the whole point was to do stuff like NFS over VSOC to the server, but I'm not, I'm not certain. Um, so it's really a question of whether the Windows NFS client supports VSOC, and that I don't, that I don't know. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anything else? All right, I'm going to post these slides on SlideShare, and the last slide I have a whole bunch of links if anybody wants to go look at the code um, that I'm referencing in patches. So thank you very much.